to being a president for all seasons. And with that, I will give you President Rosen. Tremendous, tremendous, delighted, delighted, delighted to see you all. Tremendous, wonderful to see you all. Wonderful, delighted, delighted to see you all. Mr. President and Mrs. Bush, honored guests and indeed family members, a sesquicentennial is a very hard thing to say, but it's a wonderfully fun thing to do. I want to thank you so much for this celebration of my 150th birthday. Now, indeed, some have asked, Mr. President, why are you back with us 150 years after your birth? A century after your presidency? Indeed, you know, 90 years after my corporal demise? Well, indeed, let me put to rest a pernicious rumor. There is no truth in it. I have not returned because someone needs a hunting lesson. No, indeed. You may know that my daughter Alice famously said of me, father wanted to be the bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral, and the baby at every baptism. Do you think I would miss my birthday in that case? Well, I must say, I like what you've done with the place. You know that when I became president, it was because in September of 1901, the American people and its government suffered a cowardly attack. And how appropriate tonight on my birthday celebration that President McKinley looks down upon us. Now, in September of 2001, again, the American people and its government suffered a cowardly attack. And Mr. President, on behalf of the American people, I tell you, sir, that your response and your leadership has been in the spirit of speak softly and carry a big stick, and we, sir, are with you. It was not only doubtful that I would ever get to the White House, but it was doubtful that I would live as a young boy. You know, I was a weak and sickly child. I had asthma. My father, the best man I ever knew, got me life and got me breath, often keeping me aloft in the night, having the horses tied to the carriage, and the carriage would speed through New York, getting air to my young lungs. My father came to me concerned as I continued to be a weak boy, and he said, Theodore, you have the mind, but you have not the body. And without the aid of the body, the mind cannot go as far as it otherwise might. It is hard work and drudgery, but you must make your body. I said, Father, I shall. And I set out to do exercises, to do calisthenics, parallel bars, the rings, to lift weights, indeed, even to take boxing lessons in the classical manner. And I built my body. And it does appear I may have overdone it just a bit. <laughs> but when I was in the White House at five foot eight and 220 pounds, you know I was but a mere feather of a man compared to my successor, William Howard Taft. <laughs> at times, Taft tipped the scales at over 350 pounds. When I was the president and Taft, my governor in the Philippines, we had word that he was in ill health with fever, perhaps near death, Secretary of State John Hay cabled inquiring as to his health, and thankfully Taft cabled back, health fine, rode horse 20 miles this morning. Hay cabled back, how's the horse? <laughs> Mr. President, thank you for living the vigorous life, and with the folks at the National Park Service, getting Americans outdoors, into the woods, and for great adventure, and bully to see Boone and Crockett here too. Hunters are still the great conservationists in America. I delighted, I delighted in hearing the stories of life in the White House. You know, when I did come into office that first evening in the White House, September 22nd, 1901, with my two sisters having dinner with me, I realized it was my father's birthday. And indeed, I never took a major decision without wondering what that great man did and what he thought. 
Mr. President, you know the feeling when I say, my father was the greatest man I ever knew. <laughs> now, indeed, the children were a handful. Have you heard about Archie and Quentin, the members of the Secret Service and the Washington, D.C. police officers, called them the White House Gang, along with their friends? I'd share one story that I believe is illustrative. There was a winter day I came out onto the White House driveway. I ascended into the White House carriage, and indeed, a police officer gave me a crisp salute, and just as the fingertips of his hand hit the brim of his helmet, so did a giant 30-pound snowball drop from the White House roof. <laughs> the snowball smashed through his helmet and left the officer knocked out cold on the driveway. I didn't need to look or investigate. I turned over my shoulder and said, boys, get down here immediately. <laughs> down they came. We awoke the officer, cleaned him up. The boys apologized, rightly so. And you may appreciate that as an executive manager, I looked into the issue, and indeed, the man was long overdue for a promotion. <laughs> Here in the White House, I boxed with army officers. I wrestled jujitsu and sumo with great men that the Japanese ambassador brought to me. Indeed, my most favorite fun was hiking point to point out in Rock Creek and beyond. You may know that I invited so many to come with me and discovered that too many of our officers in the army and navy were in need of better conditioning. But famous is the time I invited the French ambassador Jules Jusserin to be with me and we hiked and we hiked. We had rules on a point-to-point. -point. When you come to an obstacle, a down tree, a river, a cliff, you never went around the obstacle, but always over it, under it, or through it. Tremendous fun. But on our hike, it being a hot day, the ambassador was greatly relieved when we came to the Potomac. He thought, surely, it being a very wide, deep, and fast portion of the 